Uh, kia ora tato. welcome to the uh, Bay Plenty Civil Defence Emergency Management Group Joint Committee meeting, the final for the 2023 year today. Uh, Friday the 15th of December, we are opening our hui this morning at 10 a.m. I do have a small statement. A reminder, please, that members, I remind members and staff that this meeting is being recorded and that the recording will be made available on the Bay of Plenty Regional Council website following this meeting. Can I also kindly remind all present that local government decision making affords no protection to councillors, council officers and the public for comments made during meetings that are subsequently challenged in a court of law and determined to be slanderous. Though I know that is not the intent of any of the members of the table. Um, we wish uh, Stay Stahiri, who is not joining us today, he's unwell. So I'll open our hui this morning with the word karakia. Uh, kia inoi tātou. He pōnuri he kōrea ki te atua, e mai ngā rongo ki rinu i pukura, he whakaaro pai ki ngā tangata katoa. Honour and glory to God, peace and goodwill throughout the land for all of mankind. Amen. 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 So we'll move on to agenda item one, which is our apologies. And we have, uh, we welcome to the table uh, Deputy Mayor Shona Brown, who will represent Mayor Moore as an observer and a full participant in our meeting this morning. Deputy Mayor, welcome. We have received apologies this morning from Mayor Tapsell, Rotorua Lakes, Council Deputy Mayor Sandra Kaifong, also Rotorua Lakes Council, Commissioner Chair uh, Anne Tolley, and also Bill Wesley of Tauranga City Council, Mayor David Moore. And alternate member councillor Tom Brooks of Opaltiki District Council. Are there any further apologies? If there are none, can I go for a move, please? The apologies. So moved by Councillor Scott. Do I have a seconder? Seconded by Mayor Denia. All those in favour, please signal aye. aye. Those against, the item is carried. Thank you. We uh, come to agenda item two, which is our public forum. Is there anyone who would like? to present or speak in public forum. We have a no from uh, Councillor Thurston of Regional Council. What Wonderful like to have to you join us. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps later on, thank you. Moving on please to agenda item three, items not on the agenda. Just confirming that there are no additional items this morning. Agenda item four, the order of business, there are none. And moving on please to agenda item five. Are there any declarations of conflicts of interest from members with regards to our agenda this morning. Is there a map? We will move on please to agenda item six, which is the minutes. Item 6.1, our Bay of Plenty Civil Defence Emergency Management Group Board Committee minutes from way back on the 29th of September 2023. Uh, Mayor I believe Chair of the Day. I'm yeah. happy to move if that's, uh, if that's helpful. Happy to accept that. Thank you, the Chair of the Joint Committee. Moved by Mayor Denia, seconded by Councillor Campbell. All those in favour, please with an aye. As against, the item is carried. Are there any comments or points of clarification with regards to those minutes? Silent, that means they're great and perfect and accurate. Moving on, please, to agenda item seven. Uh, which are our reports. Turning please to pages now, uh, 22. Director Nordea, we're in your hands. Thank you. These are the uh, second quarter reporting schedule for 30 September to 30 December 2023. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as I'll take the report as read. It's the dashboard reporting uh, on the quarter for tracking against the group annual plan. And as you can see, we are tracking well at this current stage with the, many of the items well in progress with greens and a number being closed off as completed. That's the blues. So happy to take any questions on specifics, but the main thing I'd like to uh, remind members is that for local reporting of local work programs, uh, councils are encouraged to submit their reports through to the group office for this committee. And so it can be made visible as well. Uh, so we know that at each local office, Emerging Management Office, they're also following a local work program that aligns to the group one. But at the moment, that tracking is just reporting the group level. Um, I'll pause there, and then I can move to the KPI one. Um, the next reporting is the KPI measure, which is a 
measure that's in every one's uh, long-term plans, and that's around how we measure uh, readiness in terms of our staffing numbers and our trained state for response. And you can see there the figures are broken down per local authority. Um, it's tracking very well. As with anything, we can always expect that there's going to be ups and downs when staff when staff movements, yeah, staff train staff leave to go somewhere else, we have to start training new staff. But those stats are pretty looking pretty good. Um, just to clarify, I had got asked a question around the colours. The if anything to pay attention to, it's the blue. Blue indicates there's still some work to be done in that area to get to the 60 uh, target. The grey is not the target. The grey is 100%. But that's not our KPI at the moment. But that's for those who are getting ambitious and wanting to push past the, the 60%. Thank you, Madam Chair. Morning, everybody. Um, just actually looking on page 26, um, Clinton and Fakatani's blue is not looking very healthy. Is this a governance thing that we should be putting um, more emphasis on, or is it actually some sort of capacity thing that we have with I mean, staff not being uh, able to be trained in the right period of time? Because we know staff turnover is you know, probably tracking close to what the government is. But with our governance hat on, should we be putting more emphasis on this? Uh, yes, I, I would say that the minimum you should be asking some questions of your local uh, emergency management staff uh, to find out exactly what is the challenge, because everyone's different. Sometimes it's staff numbers, capacity. Other times it's availability of a point in time of staff to attend. Yeah. We know we're going through LTP cycles, which are always a challenge, releasing staff to do training when they do LTPs. So there's always nuances in each council as to why that challenge is there. But I'd like to take the opportunity to actually uh, commend Fakatani Council recently upping the resourcing and having a second EMO appointed. I think it's outstanding. So that shows that I, I've, I've got no con immediate concerns. I think we'll be on track to solve these issues. Well, thank you. If there are no other comments on page 22 of our agenda, we have a recommendation, please, from the committee. Receives the report, Bay of Plenty Civil Defence Emergency Management Group second quarter reporting schedule 30 September to 30 December 2023. Do I have a mover? So move from here. Luca, do I have a seconder? Seconded by Mayor Denia. Thank you all those in favour. Please say aye. 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 Those against. The item is carried. Moving on, please, to agenda item 7.2. Bay Plenty Civil Defence Emergency Management Group Controller Statutory Appointment on page 27 of our agenda. Thank you, Madam Chair. Again, taking the report as read and just reminding members that under the Civil Defence Emergency Management Act, this committee is the only committee that can appoint controllers for the group. And that's why this committee has been requested to endorse and approve the appointment, rather, of Nassus Rulliston Steed. He's a principal advisor with the Bay of Plenty Regional Council. He's been in local government for some time. He's been working in the Emergency Coordination Centre alongside our staff for quite a period um, and has been identified as candidate to move into a alternate group controller role. An alternate being someone who uh, would act to or in support of the group controller, which is Mark Rowe sitting in the back. So the regional council has endorsed NASA's appointment and, now this, and so has the coordinating executive groups for this committee's request to appoint NASA into that role. Move the recommendation, Jane. Move both recommendations by councillors Campbell. Do I have a second one? Seconded by Mia Luca. We have two recommendations to receive the report and approve the appointment of Nessa Wilson Steed under Section 26, uh, Part 2 of the CEDAM Act 2002. All those in favour, please signal aye. Aye. Those against. The item is coming. Thank you. Moving on, please, to uh, Item 7, Agenda Item 7.3, Bay of Plenty CEDAM Group Plan 23 to 28, Development Ministerial. Feedback. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, item 7.3 was meant to be submitted as a separate item. It hasn't been, and the reason for that is this was part of my update later, but I'll give the update at this agenda item. We submitted our draft group plan to the Minister's office before elections. We have finished our part. This committee endorsed it. We to the Minister under requirements under legislation for the Minister to provide comment. 
as everyone knows, we then went into an election and we went into a period of forming a government. Um, so that plan has had to be carried over to the new minister uh, for emergency management, and which is now recovery. Um, so we are waiting feedback on that from the new minister's office. It hasn't arrived in time as we, we, we initially had hoped would be here for today. But so we are now expecting to have that feedback for your next meeting early in the new year. So I, for as far as risk goes, it's not a risk because the legislation allows our current group plan to continue um, in, to be effective until replaced by our, our next one. The only uh, request I would make of this committee to endorse is that given we are now will be adopting that plan in 2024, we will amend the plan's timeline to be the 24 plan for five years, not the 23 plan. Because that's the update at the moment. We are waiting on the minister's feedback from that. Thank you. Thank you for that update, Director Mulday. Is there any further questions from committee members? There are none. We have a recommendation that the verbal update is accepted regarding the ministerial. Do I have a mover please, for the verbal update? I'm happy to move. Do I have a seconder? Mayor Denia. All those in favour, please signal aye. 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 Those against, the item is carried. Okay, moving on, please, to agenda item 7.4 which is regarding the delegations manual from 2023 to 28 on page 32. We have an update from Director Norday, and we're joined at the table by Principal Advisor Carla Gordon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just for those members joining us today who went at the last meeting, at the last meeting, this committee approved the delegation manual. However, there was a question of uh, legal clarification re requested around the appointment of controllers. Mm -hmm. So we took that action away and Cora has done work with legal services around that. And I'll hand over to Cora to, to explain that uh, legality and then seek this committee's uh, continued approval of that delegations manual. Thank you, Mr. Um, morning, everybody. As Clinton has detailed this document through the previous meeting and a question was raised regarding the ability to delegate the appointment of controllers within an emergency. There, is a, there was a piece within the previous version of the delegations manual that talked to uh, section 26.4 of the Senate Act, which allows the, the delegation of the, um, the, the replacement of a group controller within an emergency. And essentially the question that was asked by the committee was how far we could extend that and what it would look like in order to provide some redundancy within the region to appoint group controllers by a smaller group within this committee. So the intent that was requested was whether or not we could delegate that responsibility to the chair and two members to appoint new group controllers. We've discussed this in depth with legal and we sought NEMA's advice as well on this. And the advice that we've received is that there's a restriction within section 26.4 and it only allows for the replacement of a group controller with an individual appointed under 26.2. Now, practically what that means is we have Mark Crow as our primary group controller under 26.1. In a situation where Mark was unavailable or um, you know, it was required that we needed to replace or this committee chose to, you have the option to delegate the replacement to anyone who's appointed under 26 to. So that's myself, um, that is, and the individuals that you've recently uh, appointed, so Nassif Rollinson Steed is one of those people that you appointed today. So essentially what we've done with the delegation manual has really clarified that. The only ability that this committee has to delegate is to delegate the replacement of group controllers rather than the creation of new ones, if that makes sense as a distinction. Uh, so we've clarified that within the delegations manual just to make it really solid and to make sure that there isn't any confusion within the agency. So the intent of that clause now is that the chair and two members can work together to do that replacement and the decision of this council. Uh, if any additional group controllers are required or a, a, a different individual is required to be appointed in that, into that primary role, the full committee would need to meet to enable that to occur. Lot of wording and doubt in the legislation. Apologies. <laughs> uh, are there any questions from the committee? Just to make it absolutely clear, so the 
I get that we can only replace control of an alternate, yeah. what, someone who's already an alternate, yeah. but it, the, the idea that it's a chair in consultation with two other members, yeah. that was all fine, was it? That was absolutely fine. In fact, you could choose to do that with just the chair if you wanted to, you could to delegate that just, just to the chair. You could also choose to delegate it to the chair with three members or add another caveat. Those are your choices on what caveats you would like to put against that. Harold, I was our chair. Jeremy, oh. <laughs> <laughs> was that the suggestion <laughs> there? <laughs> All for fullness, the quorum for this committee is actually four members, so it would be better to have one plus three members would be a suggestion. Inconsistent with our quorum for this committee. One thing that would have helped to the chair, my apologies, would be to do it remotely. You wouldn't need your full meeting. It's in consultation with, it wouldn't require the full process that this meeting needs to go through. Um, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Cara. And how would that be recorded? Would it have to be uh, visually recorded or uh, written recorded? Yeah, to me, uh, Madam Chair, I think the a written re record of that would suffice for the process, uh, not necessarily visual recording. That's not part of the it's not part of the requirements though i i can imagine where someone has to be appointed um where communications are down and and so if we make the rule that it's got to be written and um then it might actually cause a problem so yeah. it, it might well, be the expectation yeah. but we have to do what is what is most practicable for the chair for clarification yes. when we say written we don't mean at the time mm -hmm. but as soon as practically possible yeah uh, our office, who would be facilitating that meeting like we do now, would make a record of that. That's what we would do in any key decision making during a response. So while while decisions are made are sometimes very fast, but the record keepers would need to make sure that key decision is recorded, who was present, who supported it, etc. So it's not it's not this form of time process. It's record keeping. Yeah, I just I just um. In the situation where we'd replace the controller, it, it, it's going to be a bit of a. Um, the, the situation will be quite messy at the best, yeah, you know, in, in that, that time. So I just wonder whether the chair needing to consult with three other members is actually quite a, quite a burden in those in those, um, those times. And uh, so we had written down two two other members. I, personally, I think that's fine. I don't think it needs another one. But um, there are two suggestions on the table, committee. And we are looking to be very practical in times of urgency. Deputy Mayor, Nick. Sorry, Madam Chair, just to, to add to that. Mm. So if the primary delegate was not available, the alternate would be acceptable. If you're doing a quick... OK. The key focus is urgency and are not allowing the processes to be obstacles in terms of being able to be responsive for our people quickly to support the team. That's the intent. Councillor Yeah, I, I, I concur. I, I think it's important that, that yourself um, and like Mayor Dean, you said, if, if, if it's only two, that's fine. Um, because if we had a Gabriel come through by a plenty, for instance, there would be um, chaos. We know that. And sometimes, you know, the, 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 it comes down to you, and that's why we put you where you are, <laughs> to, to, to take the burden. So, I, I, you know, I, I think we'll, we'll all be in a situation, should that happen, where we're trying to look after ourselves and our own respective areas. So it's just, I think it's just a, a, a no-brainer. I think the other thing is that, that we can get that message out to the rest of the, of, of the group. Uh, to what's actually going on, so that we, we're not clashing with other with other areas in that situation. But it, you know, it is a big area. That many region is a big area. Madam right. Chair, if I may just uh, draw members' attention in reference to the process we have in terms of declaring a state of emergency for yes. for the group, um, that delegation is made just to the chair. Yeah. So to declare the whole site. So, in my mind, if you, you give in that authority to the chair to declare, we call that authority could go to the chair in an emergency. 
and change the controller because then it also allows that the chairs are unavailable we have a default mechanism then it goes to the deputy chair the deputy chair goes to any other available member of committee so we follow that also for recovery transition notices so we've got two legal processes that delegate i would submit that we follow the same for the replacement it's neat and tidy it doesn't confuse it and consistency is key particularly when it's urgent thank you for that can I, can I suggest then that if, if it's that the delegation should sit with you, but maybe still consult on an informal basis because it might be a judgment call about the control at that time. Yep. I think that was the conversation we had at, at that point where someone might be overworked and not seeing clearly, and the chair to then judge on that might just want a little bit of clarification. But the delegation, just to make it um, yeah. administratively clear, should just, just be with you. to move in that way, Dania. And um, we're familiar with one another in terms of our kaitaku, our guardianship and protection of our area. Um, it wouldn't be burdening in terms of the team having to reach out in times of emergency. It would be great to have group members come actually the other way around. That would be really helpful and that consultation would occur quite naturally and quickly, which is what we're after. So we do have recommendations, please, on 32, and I'm just going to add the additional recommendation from Mayor Denia, uh, page two. We're just checking some technicality, team. One moment, please. Yes, Madam Chair, the, the current delegation sits as authority to replace us with the CDM Group Chairperson, but the note says in consultation with at least two two members. So that's the sort of procedural matter that the chair can consult any two available members in making to help inform that decision. I think that's just the So there's no recommendation. So then it's necessary. Page 45. Page 45, committee members. Thank you. We don't want to be just up here by ourselves. Page 45. Yeah, so the amendment is it's proposed there, highlighted is. So we going the amendment that Cora's bringing is that it's not no longer a full committee. It's now a consultation with two. Two. Consultation with two. It's for the amendment on the table captured on page 45, committee members. So we do have two recommendations that the group delegations manual 23 to 28 is received and as per the previous meeting on the 29th of September, where the matter was raised, clarifying process, uh, that the committee approves the group delegations manual as it sits now with that clarification offered today. Do I have a mover? The recommendations. Just a quick clarification. Sure. So that this applies to recovery managers as well, wasn't it? That was it, was the yes. aspect of it, yeah. Including recovery managers. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Exactly. Yeah. So move. Virginia, do I have a seconder? Get alternates, do it if you want to read oh, the members for voting, please. Seconded by seconded by Councillor Campbell. All, the, all those in favour, please signal aye. Aye. Those against. The item is carried. Moving on, please, to agenda item seven point five our submission to the Emergency Management Bill on page 55 of our agenda. Thank you, Madam Chair. <coughs> um, to remind members that the new Emergency Management Drop Bill was released by government for public consultation, and um, this group agreed to submit to that bill. Submissions were due by the 3rd of November. That submission was compiled and uh, consulted with the chair and deputy chair at the time, and the submission was signed off by the chair and submitted to uh, the select committee. So this uh, report now is just for information of members to for them to be aware of what was submitted from this group in, in answer to that bill. Cairo led that submission, so happy to take any questions or any technical issues, and Cairo is available to answer. <coughs> Really is a case of perhaps things changing and moving on past <coughs> for the new government, there'll be new ministers, new situations. So it might be just a case of noting it. Yes, Madam Chair, I think 
the fruit mm. from the councillors that we are waiting now, obviously with the changing government, to see where the bill will go. Uh, and we understand there's still appointments being made to select committees and such. So there, again, will be a, a bit of a delay before we hear more progress about the future of the bill. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director Milgrave. If there's nothing further, we have a recommendation to receive the report with regards to the submission to the bill as it stands under a review from the new government. I can add that, Councillor Scott. So moved by Mia Luca. Do I have a second? Seconded by Councillor Campbell. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Okay. Those against. The item is carried. Moving on, please, to page 69 of our agenda, item 7.6 briefing to the incoming Minister of Emergency Management, Minister Mark Mitchell. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. As we've, I've been working in the sector 14 years and every time there's a change of government, the central government the agencies provide briefing and reports to the new ministers. Uh, and we know the national agency does that uh, on behalf of the sector. Um, but we've had a look at that, and while we acknowledge the, the briefing the national agency gives to the minister, it's very focused on national issues and, and the national uh, policies, etc. We felt that there was an opportunity for us as a group, given we are autonomous distributed model, we are a CDM group in its own right, to provide a briefing to the minister on the Bay of Plenty specifically. So. Coro has again led a drafting of a draft here that's here today before you to seek endorsement uh, for this briefing paper to go up. And quite conscious that briefing paper means keep it brief. It's quite a challenge telling a story in a brief, but it's ultimately, as you'll see, there's a cover page and four and a half pages of uh, briefing, and then some a graphic, which I draw your attention to on page um, 78, which talks about the history of emergencies in the Bay of Plenty, which I think is quite a, a, it's a demonstration to the minister that the Bay is well practiced and experienced in this space. And then we have some agreed to put in the org chart to introduce this committee to the minister. This is the primary uh, relationship, mm -hmm. I believe, with the minister to the group will be through this committee and the chair, the deputy chair. We have a staffing one as well, um, and I have taken advice to look at incorporating a calling executive one as well. So happy for any questions on that or clarification. Cora is also here to come to Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just on page 78, great to see, although it's not that great to read, but um, to, see it, to see it graphically, just in 2005, um, we actually had the Awatauraki managed retreat at Mata. And I don't know if you were including that in the Edge Kimtara where to wall landslides, but the fact that there's been very few managed retreats done in New Zealand, that might be a, a box to highlight independently, because that was a debris flow, which is a different slide from regular landslide. That was just a suggestion to add in. Thank you, Ben. We'll take a note of that and go look at it for see how we incorporate that one. Thank you, yeah, So, um, picking up actually one of the comments that you made, um, the, uh, I remember hearing quite recently uh, Chair Tolly at the Mail Forum um, saying that talking about the, uh, the brevity needed for BIMS. And I just wonder with the length of this, is it something we're actually expecting the Minister to read? Or is it really aimed at his officials? Because it is quite, it is quite long. And some of it does talk about some of the basics of civil defence, which is, which is fine. But as a civil defence minister, I'm sure he's getting that education anyway. So talking about the four R's and, and so on, I mean, that's nice, but I just wonder if that's just extra padding that the minister might not need. All right, would you? Uh, we have not read the current BIM that's been provided by the minister, but we've reviewed the previous BIMs and making an assumption that will be based on that. Those, those previous BIMs don't include a lot of that contextual information around the four hours of the roles of the groups, hence the, um, the call to add that to here. More than comfortable with removing that would be the preference of the committee. I just wanted to explain the logic behind having it in there so you're aware of that. 
thank you for that principal advisor Cara uh, like me then we will also privy privilege actually I'm going to say to get some insider information in terms of the volume of information that's covered by incoming ministers and some mere hot tips of actually how we can really bring to the full some key points and really an invitation to meet much harder to decline an invitation or ignore some information when you're standing in front of people so that was really the indication recommendation from a former minister of the house keep it very brief keep it light really keep it local um and then follow that with an invitation then you can have the in-person discussion uh, if they are available i guess it just depends on what the honorable mark mitchell's background is he's already well versed in this stuff and there's no need to say much about knows what a poor eyes are all about <laughs> It's the will of the <laughs> Thank you. Um, and will this also go to our MPs? If it's a, the request of the committee, the request is can we also have this go to our MPs as well? This is a recommendation. This is a suggestion. This is a really great uh, representation, maybe to put up in councillor retiring rooms or to distribute a little bit wider because we're all going through, I'm sure we're all adding resilience funding into our long term plans, but this represents the why you know, very powerfully. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just if I may, we have discussed an, a, a next step in this process with the Chair and Deputy Chair, which was members will recall following local government elections, we run that seminar for elected officials for local government. Mm -hmm. uh, we put a proposal up that early in the first quarter of next year. We also run a seminar for our local MPs, uh, which the Chair and Deputy Chair will host, and we will run a very similar so we can go a bit more in depth and have a discussion about the Bay. So uh, in support, we are busy looking to establish that firmer relationship between the space. Great, thank you. So sweeping across that, we do have a plan in place uh, for our MPs. There's been a suggestion, which is a great addition, I would say, as well as the incoming uh, ministers. Those would be the first points of contact one would imagine four ministers coming into the space and also the additional recommendation as we've received uh, to keep the generic uh, civil defense perhaps just to bring that down briefing was brief really as a recommendation um, the addition of the charts super helpful in times of crisis to be able to see who you're looking for um, well done team thank you for those charts so everyone has to look exactly in the photo should, should an emergency occur in our, in our area. But it is helpful. You have to form a relationship very quickly and make some big decisions across a lot of information in terms of response. We cover everything. We have recommendations to receive the report with the additional amendments, please. And recommendation two, that we approve the draft briefing with those amendments. Uh, to the incoming Minister of Emergency Management and Recovery. I'm happy to move both recommendations. Do I have a seconder? Seconded by me. Daniel, all those in favour, please signal aye. Aye. Those against, the item is carried. Moving on, please, to agenda item 7.7 7 on page 81 of our agenda. The group Tsunami Ready Program Update. And we have uh, Director Lil Day. Supported by Karen Miller. Welcome to the table, Karen. Good. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is just a update on the progress we've been making on our tsunami readiness uh, program, which Karen will run you through shortly. And I'm really, really pleased to see the milestones we've achieved to date. And I'm also excited by the next steps that we will be looking at. So I'll hand over to Karen to run you briefly through some of those key achievements. Thanks, Karen. Excuse me, Kieran. Just before we do, we just welcome Deputy Mayor John Scrimger from Western Bay of Kitty this morning. Thank you for joining us, Deputy Mayor Scrimger. Kieran, we'll be back with you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, so, my name's Kieran, and I'm the planning team at the University of Plenty, and I am running the Tsunami Ready Program. So, this presentation this morning, uh, I'm just going to cover the aim, which uh, 
is, is to develop a coordinated approach to how we tackle day of fleeting. So it's to make sure that we're regionally consistent. So what we do is the same in each of our districts, um, that we ensure that it's aligned with national protocols and guidelines where it's applicable to us, and that what we do is based on current science. So the following presentation I'm going to uh, go through our approach to the Tsunami Ready Program, uh, in particular looking at uh, updating our tsunami maps, uh, an update on how that's been going, um, our region-wide modeling, and our tsunami impact assessment, which has just started, and the three other projects that will fall out from our assessment. So beginning with our tsunami evacuation zone maps, so the, our new maps were released uh, in early October this year, and they replaced the, the old maps. Um, so on the screen there, the top three maps that you can see were our old maps across the region. Um, they were quite varied. Um, and the bottom three maps show what our new maps look like. So as mentioned, these were released in early October, and one of the other key significant changes is that uh, we've gone to one zone. So the top three maps show the three zones. So the new map show just one blue zone for the communities and regionally consistent. So with the addition of the evacuation zone maps, uh, we also released an evacuation viewer, tsunami evacuation viewer, which is an online tool that people can go online, search their their home address, their business address, where they apply, figure out where the evacuation zone is in relation to In addition to that, we updated all the signboards across the, the physical signboards across the region. Uh, this is still, most of them have been updated, but we're still finding a couple that pop up. Uh, so as they crop up, we're uh, getting onto those. So hopefully there's not too many more of those. The release of the tsunami evacuation zone maps was um, coordinated by Lisa Glass, who is our, is our comms person, and she did a fantastic job around the, the whole region wide communication public education program that was associated with the release. So, this was massive. It went from a comprehensive social media campaign to uh, going around and talking to all the different media across the region. Um, Got great coverage from the good stories. Uh, our local, our local EMOs have been canvassing with, our, with the local communities and, and schools uh, that are incorporated into the Shake Out, uh, shake out uh, Day, which happened uh, late October. And at the moment, we're working on interim, interim evacuation signs. So the image on the left is our physical signboards that we have in the Bay of Plenty. The image on the right is a small sign that is really worldwide. So it's used in a lot of places across the globe, including here in the Bay of Plenty. And the middle sign is what we're looking to develop. That's draft at the moment, but it's what we're looking to develop uh, as, a, as a measure while we're undertaking current modeling. So, the modeling, which I'll talk to next, is due to be released in one to two years. Um, we are currently working on that. But in the meantime, for areas that don't have a physical signboard, say campgrounds or open space areas next to the post, uh, this would be the interim measure for that two year period, um, as well the other modeling. Next, we'll is the tsunami modeling. So this is comprehensive tsunami modeling for our Bay of Plenty region. So previously, we've had various modeling undertaken for different areas within our region. They've been done, been undertaken by different providers during different timeframes, different parameters. So this modeling is being undertaken by GNS or across the region, and we use the most updated information that we have. 
So they're being engaged at the moment. So GNS are working on building the model. So it's a complex project, so it does take time. And we've got Neva on board as a peer reviewer. So two reputable organisations conducting the modelling. So what they'll come up with, what they'll produce, is inundation maps, <coughs> which will turn into evacuation maps, which will replace the So they're modelling the blue zone, which was previously our yellow zone, which is based on a 2,500-year tsunami event. Uh, this will be publicly displayed. But we'll also get modelling, other modelling done, which will be small tsunami scenarios, which we'll have for our back pocket. This won't be publicly available information as such, but it'll be for us to use. Um, so should those scenarios unfold. Yes, this is the tsunami impact assessment, which we've just recently kicked off. So the purpose of this project is it's all well and good having a tsunami evacuation zone, having a blue zone, but this is about understanding what's in that evacuation zone. So we have 110,000 people within this tsunami evacuation zone. So it's looking at where those people are located, their graphics, how many schools we have in the tsunami evacuation zone, how many early childhood education centres we have, how many retirement villages we have, uh, all sorts of different aspects. So whatever stats we can find to, to really understand our evacuation zone. And this will lead on to various other projects too. So the tsunami evacuation planning. So to mention we've got 110,000 people within our evacuation zone. So if a scenario was to unfold, what's going to happen to those 110,000 people? How do we evacuate that many people? So it's not just about where they go when the tsunami hits. It's also about what happens to those people afterwards. So for instance, we have various locations along our coastline such as uh, Bowentown Heads, uh, Mowal, and even here in Pakistan, people are likely to evacuate. So, but once the once the tsunami's passed, it's, there's a good chance that a lot of those people won't be able to evacuate. So, how do we how do we care for those people who are stranded, um, as well as the other people who have made it out, say, uh, evacuation centres? So, how do we get people? out of our region for safety. The next project uh, is looking at our schools becoming tsunami ready. So we have 35 schools within our evacuation zone. Uh, a lot of these, some of these schools are completely within our evacuation zone. Some of them are only the evacuation zone only touches on them slightly. Either way, what we want to ensure is that all schools within our evacuation zone have a, a plan that is practiced um, and that all schools have a tsunami evacuation sign which is visible. So this isn't just for the kids but it's also for parents because what we don't want for parents to come back into the evacuation zone and try and rescue their kids. We want them to know that the schools have this at hand and that trust to be there. And finally just going to touch on the state highway route security. So this is about understanding um, what happens to our state highways should a tsunami unfold. State highway is an important vector for people to move at, between regions and and out of regions. If we do have a tsunami, uh, a lot of our state highways do hug the coastline, so there's going to be a lot of impacts. We're going to get a lot of isolated communities. So these are just two of the many examples. So the uh, image on the left is Area is north of Katikati, and to the right is an image uh, of one of a east. So these two are good examples of the state highway being impacted to the north or to the east, as well as to the west or south, and there's not really been any viable option or roading option to get out. So it's important to understand how how this would impact communities and how they would become isolated. So not only does it restrict people from getting out, it also restricts how to get in. So that is a very quick summary of the Tsunami Ready program on where we are at the moment and what we're going to be doing going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Kieran.
Councillor Campbell. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, for that. Um, just a question on uh, we go back to the slides that showed the metreage of those waves. I think it was two and five, was it? Middle oh, wave. The modelling, sorry. Yes. Yeah. That, that one there. Yeah. Now that. Um, so we're talking that is that new modelling is going to cover a five metre wave. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Just that I'm not into two and a half thousand years ago. I'm not interested in that because um, when there's a wave coming, it's generally let's get the hell out of here and, and, and go, go, go. But um, the other thing that concerns me, one thing you did bring up was about schools, and I was involved with the 87 earthquake here. And I can assure you that we probably need to do a whole lot of work with teachers because, and um, Councillor Amick may have remember this, she might have been a young girl at, in, in those days at the Carrow College, and everyone was just told, what, what do we do now? Get the hell out of here, run. And, and the teachers were just, in it, you know, I mean, it's quite a terrifying thing to be involved in an earthquake like that. Um, so, you know, I think there's, there's a whole lot of stuff we need to do with teachers, to be honest. But, yeah, I'm just, I'm just trying to get my head around um, if, that's, if that new, the new modelling is for a five-metre wave. Is that right? So the blue zone, so there'll be three different model outputs. So the blue zone is for the big one. So that's for, say, a return of, sorry, a return of a 2,500-year tsunami. So... It's, yeah, it's difficult to, to explain, but that sort of equates to around a, a nine to ten meter wave yep. on the coastline. So that's what, so like that's Japan, and, 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 and that's, yeah. that's 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 the most important thing to us because that's what people have got in their minds now. They see it on TV and they're like, "God, that happened here." Mm -hmm. um, but we don't want to be sitting around waiting to measure the wave as it's coming. That's all. Um, so yeah, no, that's good. That's excellent. But that, that one thing that was uh, that come to my mind was the school issue because. Teachers, bless them, are probably not the best people under under a whole lot of stress when it comes to earthquakes or tsunamis or storms. So um, yeah. everybody's trying to look up themselves. Yeah, and the, your local EMRs do a fantastic job with schools already, so they they already do this work. It's just ensuring that everyone is at the same level. Yep. Okay. No, excellent. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you. Um, I thank you, Kieran. That's really interesting. I've got a few questions. Um, one relates to the five metre wave. Thank you for the compliment, um, <laughs> Councillor Campbell. I left school in 1981. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we've, we had a uh, retirement home, uh, this is post the tsunami, with the retirement homes and the elderly came um, together and because they demonstrated the, the, the chaos and in the end it was the unnecessary chaos of moving out. That, that was a great example though for them to get ready and prepared. So they've all got run bags, they all know what they're doing, they know where they're going. But it was actually quite confusing, was it, um, this is what's going to happen for a wave greater than five metres, and now you're saying it's going to be a nine to 10 metres. So, you know, like some of the elderly are very savvy, smart people, and they want to kind of know a little bit more specifically. So if we're able to articulate that it's actually for a much larger wave, but how does it relate to the earthquake strength? So if it's a 7.2 earthquake off the offshore Nekumadex, um, you know, <laughs> we get that that's going to be a nine or 10 metre wave coming within a two-hour time frame? Potentially. Yes. So, like, I'm not an earthquake yeah. expert, but there's people a lot smarter than me than a genius that sort of figure this out, but it depends on how the earthquake, what type of earthquake it is, yeah. and how it moves, and all sorts of things. Okay, so basically anything over a six, it's a little going to be weary. The other thing is also about education into the retirement homes. So, you know, while it was a good relief that they didn't have to do perhaps an education presentation because they're very well received to it and, of course, got all the caregivers um, in there. And the other thing is with the, the tsunami-affected schools, some families have children in different schools that might not be in the tsunami zone. So are we assuming that all schools in the Bay Area will receive tsunami preparedness training? Only within the evacuation zone. Yeah. Well, we important. need to get a message out to the parents then. Yeah, it's important for everyone to be 
because we all venture into the evacuation zone from time to time when we were playing it. So it's important that we all understand, right? But it's especially important for schools with the evacuation zone. That's for Scott. <laughs> um, two, <clears throat> two sort of issues. One is um, just with tsunamis um, and taking up um, Councillor Campbell's point about um, what does this mean. I was wondering whether um, instead of calling them a you know two and a half thousand year tsunami or or whatever, if if it's a tsunami like the one in Japan or a tsunami like the one in Indonesia or a tsunami like the one at Port Matara in nineteen seventy six. You know, and that, and that then can people can relate to what the expected reaction is. Um, and also the, the point about retirement homes, but also people with disabilities, uh, especially severe disabilities, uh, moving at all is a big thing. Important if it's important, pain if it's not. Um, which brings me to my other big point, and I'm just wondering about whether we're doing joined up thinking here. So if I look through that neat chart that we saw earlier in the meeting about what emergencies have been here in the last quarter of a century. We've got um, earthquakes, eruptions, flooding, landslides, severe weather, um, and you do different things, and yet the warning system is the same. So um, if there's an eruption, we don't want to be running and having people sort of running through the through the ash laid in here. Um, if there's a um, uh, you know, severe weather, it, it's about shelter rather than high ground. So I, something for us to consider is how do we, you know, I think it's important, it's something I've been going on since March, I think, is the messaging, there is something happening. People need to know what is happening. Uh, is it something where I run or whether I stay, mm -hmm. whether I run now or, or, or later on? Is it high ground or shelter? Um, is it, um, does it affect me or can I get stay off the road so some people who've got more urgency can get there faster? So I think we need to sort of put some effort into thinking how are we going to get those messages across so that we don't cause a disaster by announcing uh, a disaster. So just put that on the agenda. I think it's really important that we have that joined up thinking because we're, we're starting to do things bitsy and it won't. Um, it'll cause a problem, I can foresee. Thank you, Director Nolde. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Very valid point. I mean, if you just look at our hazard scale for the Bay of Plenty, I always say, I call the Bay of Plenty for nothing. <laughs> uh, a wide hazard scale. And trying to manage all those. So in this point, for example, on Tsunami program, I want to emphasise the program is led by Mbob, my team, a large. But within there are different projects and work streams that different agencies or territorial authorities will own and for example evacuation planning the key players that need to assist councils with that is New Zealand Police and Fire, uh, Fire and Emergency New Zealand because they are the actual assets <coughs> on the ground doing evacuation that's an example the school readiness program we are engaging with the director from the Ministry of Education in the Bay of Plenty using them and the principals forums to engage schools so we we're not coming at it from one angle we are making sure we joined up but in terms of the communications you're hundred percent correct but I think that's where we have a really strong uh, strength and asset in Lisa Gloss. And as you may have seen in the EM updates I've been sending around, where the recognition, uh, the work done by us collectively and led by Lisa during Cycling Gabriel received an award for the way we communicated. And that's because we're taking the actual event and turning that into so what for communities. Mm -hmm. So we're making sure the language and the message is aligned to that event. Um, and that's getting that balance between pre pre training planning and then what's happening on the day and for people to remember which one is which. So it is an ongoing balance, and I think that's where the recognition of uh, in all the reviews you'll see from Auckland and that, where they talk about the importance of the specialist role of emergency communications, especially when people are panicked or people are worried, and how do you keep them calm? How do you get them thinking calmly again, logically? So fully support that, and that is a key work area we're working on. <clears throat> I'm, I'm aware of some proposed local modification of tsunami maps, uh, and, the, and whereby there's some existing community response maps with evacuation routes. They want to overlay the, the blue, blue zone on there, 
And I, so there was a, that tension between, do you just put like on there the arrows of kind of that's the general direction, or do you, you know, here's the here's the route you take? Um, is there a move to have consistency there, or is, or is that local modification mm -hmm. okay? Or what's what's your view there? Yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm aware of um, a couple of communities that have taken the blue zone and made it their own, and that's great. That's that's taking something that is their own, and we support that. Um, so it's up to each community if they want to have their more spoke lanes, which suits them. Um, but we also have to consider, say, for example, tourists who come to the region. So we need to have, mm -hmm. have that consistency. So, that the the same so yeah, I completely support that, and that's great that they take that to, to make it their own. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from committee members? Uh, thank you for your presentation, Kieran. Uh, appreciate all the work from the team. We've had some messages of co communication relativity, I think might be the concept that was suggested from Councillor Scott. Councillor Kim. Yeah, just, a, just a point. Kieran, can we get a copy of those? The, are we going to get a copy of those maps? We had a copy of previous maps, and they were a bit confusing, I have to say. And these ones might be a little bit better, but it would be quite good for this this group to get their head around exactly what we're talking about too. Yeah, so you're talking about all the blue zone best ways. Yeah, so they're on our website. I can send you a link to where they are. Okay. I can send you a link to the online viewer as well. That would be awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and also, I would have a copy of that presentation to do with councillors because you could just easily do that in the retiring area outside of, outside of meeting time. But uh, I think it actually really reflects the progress that we've made. And when we were out speaking with our members of the community, you know, not that we want to just give them another presentation, but we can we can actually demonstrate where things are falling in. Yeah, absolutely. You know, just, I just totally agree That's with okay. what the councillor <coughs> said. I think we've got to start using our councillors uh, as champions also, not just the people that are sitting around this table, because they're the people that are out in the community and, 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 and are talking and letting people know. Uh, being Kiwis, it's, uh, she'll be right, mate, but um, yeah, we've seen too, too, too many of these disasters around the world now, and it's, uh, it's not, can't be too, you know, can't be too blase about such things, can we? And especially in the next couple of weeks where every crazy Kiwi decides to migrate to the ocean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the worst thing into the sun, more than any. Uh, so yeah, we've just got to be very, very mindful of, of you know, letting, letting those campers and, and people that are visiting the area know exactly what, not so much danger, but be aware of where, what, you know, could happen. So thank you for that. Thanks. Thanks, Karen. Thank you, Councillor Campbell. And it's a point that uh, Mayor Dina always reinforces that actually localism is key and when emergencies do happen, whatever role anyone may play in terms of the civil defence structure, it's actually your local elected officials that your community looks at demanding to know what needs to be done. So encouraging and not losing sight of that particular project as well. Um, just a thought that I had also, thank you very much for all of the information within that presentation. I did hear a... Uh, Mark, a comment regarding you know, when you have um, parents who would potentially go into dangerous zones. We've seen examples across the Bay of Plenty where it doesn't matter <clears throat> that your natural parenting instinct will kick in more than any other authority directive that's ordered. So, um, you know, co-designing is key and inviting people in. I'm aware that post the earthquake swarm in our community in Kawira, <laughs> um, we've encouraged families to really get active in creating their own whānau plans of where to go and who you'd go to. If that conflicts with the school plan, you're going to have more unnecessary uh, conflict, I think, at a time when we need to be co-designing that. So it's no, no one plan is right or wrong. Who has more authority than the other? It's co-designing is key. Um, that, that's also part. And look, we can't do everything all at the same time. I hear your call, Deputy Mayor, among your community. We have a number of parents who have education, kids in different schooling areas. Um, we can all work together. It's not doing everything all at once, but staging and phasing that out would be beneficial for our Thank you for your work. We look forward to you sharing the presentation 
and we will commit, I think, from committee members to be champions in our local authority uh, to be able to promote that work. Thank you. So we have we have no more comments. We have recommendations. We have recommendation, Chief. We have three. Receive the report, approve the next key projects as outlined. And as we've just covered, committing our respective local authorities to lead and all supporters identified. Moved by uh, Councillor Campbell, do I have a seconder? Seconded by Mayor Denia, thank you. All those in favour, please signal aye. Aye. As against, item is carried. Moving on, please, to agenda item 7.8, Cyclone Gabriel Disaster Relief Funding Report, brought to us by Director Morgan Will also invite you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to, um, to refresh members, the following Cyclone Gabriel, the government gave out re relief funding through NEMA to various regions, and the Bay of Plenty received $200,000 in relief funding. Um, it was then up to this committee to decide how that was appropriated out to respective impacted territorial authorities. Uh, Western Bay of Plenty District Council applied initially for a, a, an amount and was granted 100000 no one else indicated that they had a need, and Western Bay applied then for the balance, and that was approved by this committee. So Western Bay received the total funding, and their report is attached of how that has been utilised. Welcome, Mandinia, if you would like to speak to the actual. Yeah, I just want to say um, we're grateful for the, the support we've received and, uh, through, through this committee, and, and obviously um, part of the chain. I think that's, um, that the people who received the, the money um, a great benefit for them uh, when when uh, the damage they they received uh, hit them. So uh, yeah, that's all good. And having visited the sites, it was um, maybe the sites that have been damaged. It was uh, you know it's not it's not, well, not quite like in on the east coast and, and while or around there, but it's uh, mm -hmm. uh, in localized pockets. It was it was pretty bad. Mm -hmm. it just orchards washed away and uh, yeah, it's quite significant damage, but just more localized. So. Thank you for that. Thank you, Councillor Campbell. Yeah, through there, I have to agree with Mandini on that because you know what happened in Barrow a few months back, and um, <coughs> green goes nowhere, absolutely nowhere. And I think that, that brings uh, something to, to my mind now that um, what concerns me is there are a lot of people now, um, and I'm not, not, I'm not just standing up for the the elderly and the and the rest of them, but there's a lot of people that can't afford insurance and they're not paying the insurances now. They're paying rates, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and that that sort of puts things in a, in a different perspective. And I, I know my own situation uh, with the earthquakes in Kaura, um, I was just paid out this week $32,000. Um, I know, I know. But I'm, I'm aware of what the way to go and go about it. But there are a lot of people out there that are, are really, really struggling with some of the stuff. And when I hear what is happening in Auckland and, and, and in, in uh, Hawke's Bay, it's, a, it's, a, it's just a, a dog's breakfast. And I feel I feel a little bit sorry for the officials, to be honest. Um, and I've, I'm, I've sort of been, it's been a, a weekly discussion with, with, with our earthquake and war people, but insurance companies really have to come to the fore. But the, the downside to it, is that you're getting paid out by insurance companies and what do they do? They up the rate, they up their, their premium. So that's the sort of thing that you are up against and, and it's you know, it's a little bit of a kind of trade off where you're coming and going from here. But you know, Mayor Dean is right. If, uh, if you have a, a flood, for instance, it's, it's, it's here and gone, but the damage is it's, it's, it's unbelievable. And you know where I live and, and of course we've had um, Subsidence, bank subsidence, all the rest of it. So that's been a bit of. I can assure you that thirty thousand plus does not work. I mean, I've had to pay out even more. We can't see. Just add a little detail to that, if I may, Madam Chair. Uh, you know, so some of the, the the people who are claiming for, for damages are wanting some support. You know, they, they'd say, you know, lost half a million dollars, a million dollars, whatever. And it's, Thousand. Know, <laughs> sometimes felt a bit inadequate, but it's you know, if it'll help, so I think yeah, it does. They're, they're appreciative. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of that was lost earnings, so it wasn't appropriate, but it was um, just see the loss overall for them. I think 
strategy of just through the chair. I think the most important thing, and you, you know that I've got experience in self-insuring. Uh, it's not a, it's not a thing you should do. Um, it can cost you a, 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 an absolute fortune in the end. So uh, my advice is to be well and truly insured. It's mm -hmm. a big thing, but you, know, you can afford it. Is the other issue? Did you mean? Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a good conversation, mm -hmm. these insurance, and uh, while this is not a political group per se, um, maybe it's a local government thing that we, we look at for next year and looking at trying to get, for those people that now can't afford insurance because of the escalation, maybe some sort of third party insurance for disaster recovery? You have third party car insurance, maybe some sort of, you know, minimal sort of insurance so people aren't quite totally left without anything to be able to claim for. Almost like an earthquake fund. <laughs> yeah, well, how easy is that to access? <laughs> Thank you, Epimia and Mac. Well, look, a consideration in terms of the function and role that this committee and this entire um, civil defence response has in the recovery phase, it is an extension of the recovery phase. It's the practicality of it and a consideration perhaps for the Minister of the Day and those involved at NEMA, there was a consideration. I for one was sadly, fortunately or unfortunately pleased to see the retrospective funding uh, regime was very difficult, I understand. So local authorities will respond in our natural civil defence role. However, we start to get down to pennies and cents and to have assigned allocated funding available for our specific region, I was very thankful for, yeah. so that we weren't competing with the likes of the Hawke's Bay region sort of stuff, that we could have some localised responses here. Um, those might also be additional considerations just to highlight in the incoming brief much as we want it to stay brief, that is a key consideration. Nine months, did you say, Councillor Campbell, to wait for that from our swarm in March um, is a long time if you have the means to be able to hold yourself for that time. Yep. If you don't, that's a pretty long time. So I'm actually happy if there's no further comments, I'm happy to move recommendations that the report is received and to direct uh, Director Morgan. Uh, to provide a final report to NEMA on the spending of the Bay of Plenty Group uh, Cyclone Gabriel Disaster Relief. Do I have a second? I have a second. I thank you, Councillor Campbell. All those in favour, please signal aye. Aye. Those against, the item is carried. Moving on, please, to agenda item 7.9, our presentation of the fuel. And we welcome to the table Manager of Operations, Mark Crow, Mark Hall. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Just as my yes. this is just a uh, follow up from a request from a previous meeting mm. of this committee where you sought a bit of a brief around our regional fuel plan that has been implemented for the Bay of Plenty. And Mark's here to give you a high level view of what a regional fuel plan is. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Apologies, I'm probably going to go off the script a little bit with some presentation. It's going to be said we had a wee chat before the session, so I'll just change my pitch a wee bit. So the slides won't be that relevant. So, <laughs> God, and then I'll give you a summary. So, as you will be aware, we have uh, presented you with the group of fuel and priority document. It sits under a national level document, which is. Um, Provides the requirement for us to have a regional operation uh, and, and that's fine, but it's, it's not necessarily the what, I think. Today it's more so what. So what does that actually mean? And how is that applied across the bay? So through the regional plan, we've identified things such as the priority users, priority fuel sites, and the uh, how we uh, prioritise those sites, who accesses them, and what the basic fuel levels are, or what the predicted fuel level usages are for the utilities across the region. And by utilities, I'll talk to like power companies, telephone companies, um, water supply authorities, yourselves, road authorities, yourselves, and your contractors. Uh, 
NZTA we are this week, aren't we? We're not Waka Katahi anymore. So NZTA, uh, and they've all consulted in the, in the compilation of the regional plan, so we understand what those fuel requirements are, and that's not that's not in effect, that means should we hit a situation where we have fuel shortages, whether that be um, a normal supply and demand issue or because of uh, an emergency, then the plan is activated through either the group office or if it's a local level issue through the local EOC, uh, which is within your respective organisations, they communicate up to group through my office effectively if there's a declaration in place. And I work with uh, the office at NEMA, the NCMC, which is issues that for today, the NEMA office, um, and there's a fuel sector coordinating entity within there. So there's a little a group in there that manage the fuel disruption element. And that's chaired by representatives from NEMA and NB. So that's the sort of coordination aspect. It's if you consider Gabrielle, perhaps for context, um, that I imagine that was fairly active in the NCMC, and they'll be getting multiple priorities from multiple groups and then prioritising those at an actual contribution pattern. So it's, it's uh, like all responses are, it's bottom up in terms of demand, um, and then coordinated at a national level or a regional level as required. Okay, that gives you the operational overview of the plan, but I'm happy to take any questions on it. Any questions from committee members, please? Is there a note? Mark, thank you for sharing that uh, with us. It's probably the polar opposite to the previous um, item. We did actually have some allocated funding uh, at a local level. Now we've gone the other way where it actually sits in a national plan. Thank you for sharing that. Mm. It's good to know, and we understand that it become quite competitive. There are other areas across the country uh, that are also in need fuel supply. Thank you. There's nothing further. One thing, one thing that brings a yes. point of mind, and it happened in Hastings, and that is, mm. it's actually all very well to look for people. For fuel and that, but if you can't pay for the bloody stuff, it's a real even, even bigger problem. Uh, and that's that's when your electronics are down, um, and those are those are real issues that come to mind. Um, and I, I'm not going to because of the people around the room. I've got to be a bit careful what I say about electric cars and diesels and all the rest of it. But when the water's flowing over the bonnet, I can assure you, I know which vehicle I want to be in. <laughs> and um, so yeah, it's a, it, it, it is something you've got to be brought to mind, and it's how to how to make sure you've got enough fuel around to, to actually move around the countryside. And that's even from the organisation, like um, uh, regional council, for instance. You know, you have people out there and and um, get them moving. Manage crew, please. Thank you, thank you. It's a valid point you raise, um, Councillor Campbell. So uh, a couple of things with that: the fuel plan. Probably working at a national level when the electric car fleet was not as large as it is. So it wasn't actually addressed all that well in the national document or in the regional one. So I think we'll see that in the next generation. In terms of, um, you can't necessarily pay for it. Mm -hmm. What I did witness uh, in the whole today during the event was two things that were important to pay us for that. One was the ability to technicians and funding around to supply ATMs, even an initiative by the Reserve Bank to, believe it or not, fly in portable ATMs to support them with the cash. And the second one, which was more successful at the time, was issuing at a local level of fuel chits, effectively, to support welfare requirements out of council offices and to be presented to primary fuel stations to supply fuel. So even though the cash supply had run out, a negation was put in place to allow people to sort of basic the other things we may have to consider in extreme circumstances. Tonight also there was the other issue is fuels usually under the ground. <coughs> so how, how how did they when the when there was no power, how were they getting it out of there? So in, in our fuel plan here there are those priority stations uh, identified and they either have 
a generator on site or they are hardwired to accept a generator. So in those cases, if you're getting a generator there, plugging it in, starting it up. Okay. That's part of the purpose of it. Yeah. Identify those and then there's an element which can be supported at a local level. And I'd encourage you to go back and ask that question. What is being done at a local level to build that resilience, to get more more stations connected? So we've got a list. I'll be frank, it's a fairly short list. So there needs to be more done at a local level, more generators in place or more solutions in place to alleviate that pressure should, it, should the day come. So this is a little bit like like supermarkets now have, will have a, a, generation, a generator on site. So when you say something needs to be done at local, sorry, at local level, who, where, and by when? Uh, that's that's probably not up for me to determine the work program at a local level. All I'm saying is, most regions, most district councils, have one fuel station. Some have two. Um, it would be more. It would be great to see more than that. So I would encourage you to go back through the CE down to your down to your EMOs and ask that question as. How can we support building more resilience across our fuel supply infrastructure? Thank you, Manager Crona. It is essential that we are asking the question and providing support versus where is your plan and what is going to happen. Um, that absolutely we're leaning in to support that and the benefit of shared learnings. Yes. I am sure that uh, Mayor Stoltz of Tairawhiti in particular, I've heard you speak about the frustration of people not being able to access fuel before we can even dream of um, having things shipped in and out. And also all of our mayors of the Corpus Bay community as well. So thank you for that. If there's nothing further. Can I just say a point of clarification yeah. following on from Councillor yeah. Scott? Um, so you're saying that most councils have a couple of preferred service stations or fuel sites that they potentially might not have any generators in reserve if we needed to get access to it and that we should check that we are putting in place litigation for that. Correct. It's actually easier to state the ones that do have it rather than the ones that are not. So, for example, Whakatane, as we were made aware on the last review, has one, which is gas, GAS in Makata. So that is the real gap. Because I'm sure of the council fleet at the moment. So there is, there is some work to be done, and it's been identified, but it needs to be pushed at a local level mm -hmm. to support these fuel stations to, to get that resilience in place. Because yeah. that, that ultimately, like I'll be frank, ultimately that affects all the utilities who are then trying to fuel up to continue. Or on the day, it creates extra load for your EOC trying to put a mitigation in place for something. It would be really useful to bring that in a practical way through to one of our committee meetings and infrastructure. Director yeah. Lorde. Uh, Madam Chair, I think just to support it from you, a modern society be, actually becomes less resilient when we all switch to fuel cards. So the first question I ask you, what is your fuel card your organisation runs on? Because at the moment that means you're only filling up at certain fuel stations. All the others you're not authorised to because you're not on that fuel card. Mm -hmm. So your your whole network has shrunk right down, or do you have a mechanism to pay another company to get fuel? So that's a simple thing there. And then when you look at where your narrow network is, which one of those stations are resilient? So I encourage you to do get your staff to have an analysis of that and just desktop it and say, what if our fuel supplier was gone? And I'm not talking about the actual fuel, I'm talking about the company you're paying every day to run your fleet. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Some work for us to do. Let's take that closer to home and support our networks to be able to be better prepared. In that case, thank you, Manager Crow. Happy to move receipt of the uh, regional fuel plan. Do I have a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Campbell. Those in favour, please signal aye. aye. Against. The item is carried. We are joined. Our next agenda item is 7.10. The presentation of Fire and Emergency New Zealand. So I'm hopeful that that's young Paul Hunter that's joining us. If you come on forward, Paul, welcome. Kia ora.
Tato. My name's Paul Hunter. I'm um, with Biomedics in New Zealand. I currently in a role in risk reduction. Also, also I'm a wildfire uh, response manager as well. So I'm doing this presentation. Thank you for the invite. Um, in behalf of uh, Jeff Maunder, who's our district manager, who unfortunately couldn't be here this morning. So as we know, the, the um, our fire emergency in New Zealand, our Bay of Island, Bay of Plenty, Bay of Plenty district goes um, right down into the South of Waikato as well. So it includes um, Rio and um, down to um, Warawara, close to Waikato Beach and across to um, Whakaroa Bay. Okay as well. So it's a large area, but of course for this um, feature here, of course, it's the basically it's the Bay of Plenty, it's a, some of the biggest management groups uh, line. So with uh, wildfire management, Fire Emergency New Zealand has a responsibility of uh, not only responding and putting out the fires, but also reducing the risk of fires as well as uh, under the Act, the New Zealand Act. So we we can't do it our, uh, on our own. So um, we, we we need pay people. We need partners in this, and we've realised that. And we we think we're growing that relationship with our partners and our stakeholders because we realise we we need to do this together. So that includes the people, groups such as the EWE, departments, conservation, territorial authorities. Forestry pay a big part, forestry managers and owners, um, of course, farming groups, and then the horticulture lifeline industry. Um, even Manuka oil extraction, it's kind of a, an unknown for me, but it is a growth, especially the east coast, where uh, Manuka is growing commercially um, and they extract the oil. So it's uh, Manuka is a, a highly volatile plant. So they work alongside us as are the um, as well. So to manage the response and the risk reduction of wildfire, we um, have an obligation, firstly under the Act, to supply a fire plan. So at the moment we're in the process of updating our fire plan. Our current fire plan goes from 2021 through to 2024. So at the pro at the moment, we're process of going through a, a, a draft mechanism of getting the next edition. So 224 to 227, and we have opened that up to consultation. So we've been through um, a partner and stakeholders consultation, and to basically the. People that came to the party were mainly the forestry management group throughout the district. Um, historically, they've always had a, a big role in both the response side of fire, but also uh, risk reduction because of their large assets and the history of what wildfire can do to the industry. We did put it out to other groups and hopefully after that, we have a, another consultation period which um, will be opening up in February, where that goes out to the public as well. Hopefully, we might get some more input from some of those other groups, for example, the farming group, horticulture group as well. So, we also have a response plan which we have drafted, and what that is is a plan that we look at status, the fire season status, and we go, well, if it's low, medium, high, very high, what do we need to do then to change our response so that our response is getting the right uh, and right uh, resources at the right time? And it's a change at the moment. We have a, a, a different sort of um, response system where, like here in Pakistani, Bells go down, we have a set response of two fire trucks going. But if it was a very high fire danger, we need to look at what is the difference and what the fuel risk is. So that's where those two documents are very important documents. And um, we, we do go to consultation on those two documents. So a big part of our 
formulating a fire risk management is is science. And um, because we're dealing in an environment, um, a natural environment, there's these natural elements. So what are those elements that lead to fire startup and growth? Well, first of all, of course, we've got fire weather. Now, we've got fire weather, well, that's, that's every day. So, for example, yesterday, uh, it was very hot. It was about 31 degrees in Apurika yesterday. Uh, low humidity, strong winds. Um, and we saw a few fires start up yesterday. So fire weather and it also gets affected by seasonal changes. Summer, winter is different. Um, and also these larger events like El Nino, La Nina, which is kind of the flavour of the day at the moment. Um, so we're watching and we're seeing what what this year um, or going into early next year is going to bring. The other things that come into that are vegetation types. And as we know through our, our region, uh, in region, we have all sorts of different vegetation types. Um, we have forestry, of course, uh, the native um, Nahiri, as well as the scrublands and grasslands as well, which changes whether you're close to the beach or you're up on a... So that's where the geography fits in. There's also the past history. So where does fire start? You know, some... Uh, some communities are more known to light fires for different reasons. A lot of it's to do with um, land clearing or getting rid of rubbish or whatever. So we, we look at that and so we have to add that into our prediction as well to see um, how we're going to manage fire and also the, for the reduction but also for the spikes as well. So in that fire weather, going to a science, but it's important because it's a big part of our our document, especially our uh, fire plan. It's based about these indices where we will change from an open fire season to restricted to prohibited, which means no fire ban. So it's based a lot around the science on fire weather. So what is the current climate and, we, and what is the prediction of weather conditions coming? So that data is collected from various weather stations that we have through the district and for a minute, New Zealand owns a number of about 24 throughout our district. And we also are able to gather data from the Niwa um, sites as well that they have. So that data, which is mainly rainfall, wind speeds, humidity, temperature, and that goes in to make these indices. So I'll talk very quickly on these because there's the fine fuel moisture code, we have the duff moisture code, the drought code, the build up index, and the initial spread index, and that's kind of perfect. So I've kind of explained it. And what that does, it gives you an insight on why um, the, the weather is important to us and how that is a um, determining factor on us being ready to respond to wildfires, but also how we can reduce it. So the fine fuel moisture code, that's really important at this time of year. And yesterday, for example, sun's shining hot, the wind's blowing. So your, your plants like your courses, your manuka, kanu, um, they are very flammable with our small service area. That's where fires start. They start in those fine fuel. So for us, there's a risk reduction and, and, and the teams around the district. Our workers, like yesterday, we had a fire um, up at Kōrere where the roadside mowing was a beautiful project to get that grass cut before the summer. Roadside mower going along, must have hit a stone or a piece of metal, and it started to spark and it started to fire. So that's the evidence of how those fine fuels uh, and our management of how our communities look after their anywhere, as it were, their, their land, they need to mow around their properties and keep the grass low, um, is important. Drought code important because, of course, when it's been dry, the fuel fuels dry out and they're more, um, you know, it's like you get a wet piece of wood or a dry piece of wood which burns the best. So that's important. So there's a number of different ways. The bottom one is important for us is grass curing. Now you'll know in summer what you know, good summer. <laughs> Um, the grass goes brown and it gets straw like. So for us, that's another part of the science that goes in to help us to develop those fire seasons. So currently we're sitting, um, we're probably sitting in moderate at 
the moment, but our fire season is open. That means that anyone can go about and light a fire. We're looking at the way that we're heading towards through the summer, but possibly, possibly either before or not far after Christmas, we'll go into restricted. That means there's a permit system needed. So we have a very good website with that to explained, and um, it, what that does is it gives us a mechanism, not just to restrict people lighting fires, but it gives us a mechanism to give them advice how they can burn safely you know, to give conditions around. So that's um, important. So in the Bay of Plenty, immunity <coughs> wildfire risk. So. We, we have looked at this and we, we see that some of our community have a potential for wildfire to impact, impact that community, whether it's just an individual house or it's a whole community or it's even just their work spaces, whether it's horticulture, agriculture or forestry as well. So we, we kind of went through a few, um, and most of them, of course, be coastal. Yeah, the coastal communities, uh, Eastern Bay of Plenty, up to the, up to the Cape, uh, very vulnerable because the sandy soils. Um, they have those offshore, uh, um, onshore winds during the day. When the sea breeze comes in, that drives things out. Um, then you've got places like Koro, Minganui, where you've got communities living amongst a pine forest. Um, so that's another area where we, we, we're looking at the, the risk there and how we can minimise, firstly through your reduction strategies, but also if there is something, throwing more at it in response capability. So that's communities surrounded by forested areas. And with Kodo, for example, we, the Kodo, it's got pumice soils, it dries out very quick. And you see the grass change, you'll see it at the moment change from green to go to brown. So that fine fuels there, we can start a fire and move into the forest. Um, then we've got the offshore islands, ones that are populated. For example, one there, Marikana Island, historically had a couple of fires. So they are communities that we have as having a risk. And we're making strategies around um, the reduction and also response. We've just done a visit out to Mutiti last week, with the community out there. Um, very good. And, and to see this, the landscape um, and the hazardscape out there in the community as well is important. Um, so that's me. Questions? Uh, yeah, in Australia, about 50% of bushfires seem to be deliberately lit um, or, or dodgy anyway. Here, what would the proportion be? And what could we do about it anyway? That's a good question. 99% um, of fires in New Zealand are started by humans. Um, but our statistics on the um, arsenic. A lot, and we, we're working more on this because a lot of our vegetation fires aren't investigated. We're changing that policy to try and get more investigations into the startup. Generally, it's just carelessness. It's usually um, of, of the one percent. Is it lightning strike? Because we don't have much real yeah, lightning, and um, <laughs> yeah, have to be something like that. Mm -hmm. This is my Peter Pate. <laughs> um, <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> yeah, I, I live, live with 90,000 hectares of Pinus radiata right around us. And I think this is important. That, and, and Have you got insurance? <laughs> don't worry. Don't worry. It's something that really concerns me. Um, uh, but um, I see Rotorua. You haven't got Rotorua up there, but no. um, you know, you've got a, a redwood forest right amongst the, the whole border in the city. So the, it is a real. The real issue it always has been for me, um, and even after um, the blogged, you know, the, the, the waste and, and slash is, is probably just as volatile afterwards. That's it's always been a big issue for me too. But um, I think this is where spatial planning is really, really important. Um, and uh, so yeah, what's the space? But you know, the amazing part about it, um, uh, Paul, is that. 
six months ago, we were all washing kaora, um, and something I'd never seen in seven decades of living there. Um, and now, like you said, that wind came in. I, I was driving home last night, and I could see the, the haze up in, up in the, the valley, and the places just burnt overnight. And it has, ha and particularly happens in the only pure area. Um, the worship parents live there, um, and wildfires and grass are a real issue around our area. And in fact, I've even seen our schools catch a light. And, but people don't quite realise how dangerous um, grass fires are because they travel so fast, and they, it's quite explosive, isn't it? So that's that's another issue with it. But yeah, I'm take take um, take note of what uh, Mayor Lucas said. Uh, there's always those people that, that, that get a buzz about lighting fires. And, um, I mean, well, you can take the Australian numbers as a guide. So are you saying that we're worse than Aussies? No, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that it's simply than Aussies, and you can expect the proportion of them are yeah. deliberately lit. And so, you know, maybe there's something in the education sphere you can do or whatever. Deputy Mayor McGill, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. And, and quite timely, um, we've been looking at some of our emergency management and resilience um, plans that we've got going forward. Will you consider the south part of our district, in fact, it's Arne, out through Murupada and Manganui and, and through Atoki, et cetera? When we're talking about tsunamis and earthquakes, it's a little bit like well, you're doing all this work for them. What are you doing for our most immediate risk, which is fire? And I know that the Mutapata Community Board and Iwi Chairs are really concerned about this. So it's been a really good reminder for us to perhaps not minimise it um, just because they're not living on the coast and with the larger population. So thank you. If you may direct them. Um, I just want to reinforce that uh, one of the key things we've been doing of recent times is we've been interagency supporting fens with exercises. So when they exercise their lead agency roles for fire, we had staff from group and local emergency managers going along because we work out how we support that in terms of the consequence. So we go, we share similarities. There may be people evacuated, whether it's for a tsunami, a flood, a fire, doesn't matter. It's how we look after them. So. We are doing a lot of cross-agency work in this space. It's a cu oh. I'm curious to know uh, how how well equipped are we with helicopters with fire buckets and all that? So nationally, um, we use a, a what we call the air desk. So what that does is we've gone to um, uh, the Amphitz with and we've asked them if they want to be part of the team. So what that meant to be part of the team, they had to do certain things to get their aircraft up to standard, and we uh, ordered that. Um, so it also gives them a, a, a ability to track where they are. So for example, if there is an incident, it will, we will know where the nearest aircrafts are, and then we will. So we, we've, we've, it's an Australian-based um, idea, and we've copied that. So that's, that's the system we're using. We seem to be pretty, pretty suited to the number of um, helicopters and fixed wing that's needed at the moment. Oh, my point was to, to support um, Clinton's about um, interagency communication and that's joined up thinking that we are talking about earlier on, mm -hmm. communication plans and so on. So good to hear. Thank you for your presentation, uh, Advisor Paul. Uh, I can assure you that in Kawero that is not something that's taken lightly. In fact, it's quite cyclic that as the season starts to uh, warm up, particularly in the community of Kawero, that is a regular engagement uh, and a conversation. I was fortunate to be able to acknowledge alongside Fred Dykes in our local area three, five, ten, and 47 years of service. I happen to know that particular person started in 1976. No need to share why I could figure that out very quickly. Uh, but we do thank you for your presentation and the joined up thinking. Again, we'll take that closer to home uh, and be able to join up with our local communities to support the work that you do. Um, we do have a recommendation, please procedurally, to receive the presentation today from 
Do I have a mover, please? Councillor Campbell, thank you. Do I have a seconder? Yeah, Luca, thank you. All those in favour, please signal aye. Those against, the item is carried. Thank you. Moving on, please, to agenda item 7.11, the verbal update director, Neil David, did share earlier regarding the ministerial review. Is there other, any other updates you would like to share? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. As you indicated, I only had two key ones. I've already shared the one about the update. So the only other one I want to emphasise, and obviously Lily from Neem and I have to deconflict our updates, uh, that she wants to give the update from the national side. So not to repeat everything, but I just thought I'd, uh, there is a slight overlap, and I'll go a little bit further, and that's the national exercise plan for 2024. Um, so to ex uh, the exercise, is a tier four or what we call a national exercise that's been planned by the government. It's led by the National Emergency Management Agency in 2024, and it will be um, in mid, mid year. It will be based on a South Island Alpine Fault earthquake scenario, which is a lot of work being done at the moment, yeah. And before everyone goes, oh, what does it mean for us? That's the Alpine Faults down South Island. Well, half of New Zealand's no longer operational, the other half has to be there. So, Quite frankly, another Cyclone Gabriel type scenario where there's a lot of impact to one part of the country and does the other part work and support. So that has been advised to us that this will be kicked off. Um, the exercise itself practically will run over three separate days uh, and these dates will come out in the, in the minutes and, and uh, my update later this afternoon. But to the 12th of June, Wednesday, there will be a, a, what we call a functional exercise where we're expecting emergency centres to stand up and activate and, and react to the scenario. And following that on Wednesday, the 26th of June, there will be a, what's called a desktop exercise. So that's more where we will sit around and then discuss the sustained response. So what, taking it forward, what, what does it look like? And then on Wednesday, the 10th of July, there will be a third desktop exercise uh, which we'll talk about the transition to recovery. So now getting out of the initial response, looking at what does the longer term recovery look like. So the Bay Plenty group is expected and will be participating, all of us, uh, alongside all our national partners, fire and emergency, police, et cetera, in that exercise. Our office will be the point of coordination with the national planning team around what is the actual exercise going to look like, and we'll be giving you updates as those come out. Our plea, though, is to all members to make sure you are touching in with your local emergency management staff and your local controllers, recovery managers, to understand what to what level they are going to be engaging in your work. Um, and it would be a good opportunity for yourselves and your elected officials to play alongside and see what role they would play. So it starts with June the 12th. Yeah. 12th of June and the 26th of June? And the 10th of July. And the 10th of July. Um, yes. Yes. Another one, pet hate of mine. Uh, earthquakes. Um, oh, you know, we're actually talking about A8. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Okay. Is, is everybody aware of what A8 is? I'll tell you what, you need to be. Um, you know, you, you might not have any power with A8 taken off, and it's Alpine fault uh, and A8. Um, Magnitude eight uh, um, on the Alpine Fault, right the way up the backbone of the, of the South Island, which could put just about every every dam and every, every power source out of action for, however. Um, so that's a real it's a, it's a real real issue. And South Island is a, a sort of gearing up for it now. They're gearing up for it. Well, I know that is, my son deals in generation, and he's he's um, it's a big business, big deal. So yeah. It's a, and we think we're all safe up here, and we probably are from the actual shape, but it's the of heavens if they cut our power for a start and generating up here to keep Auckland going over to that now. So, Thank you, Councillor Campbell. So for all committee members, we do have some dates to look forward to, and also in the sense of being um, informed and then being prepared, because the art is actually conveying the information that we receive be able to give a sense of in times of an emergency where there's an event outside of our control is that we have some knowledge of where to go. I think it's important that, that everybody around the table knows what A8 actually stands for. I, I actually don't, I'm not trying to 
say that I know everything, which is unusual for a butcher. <laughs> um, it's just that something was, was, was I've been involved with down in the South Island. And I'm all now, so that's... And so, Campbell, if you have links and information to go on, share, go online, A8. it'd be for that to be shared you, you in advance of the workshop. Don't worry about solar flares. And... Okay. I'm not worrying about too much what's coming out from the space yet. I'm more worried about what's on the ground. Just... Thank you, Councillor. So, not just the event in itself, but what our people do <laughs> in the case that that event should occur. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. There's nothing further no. from Director Norden. We uh, can I call for a mover, please, to receive the verbal update by uh, Luca, seconded by myself. All those in favour, please signal aye. 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 Those against, the item is carried. Moving on, please, to agenda item 7.12. We're joined today by a regional advisor, Lily Fights, on behalf of NEMA, our National Emergency Management Agency. Thank you, Madam Chair. Tira, tira, tato. Uh, NEMA has provided an update in the agenda, and I'm happy for it to be taken as read. If there are any questions, I'm happy to take those as well. So the calls just had the update from the Director Norday regarding the roof in the month moving into our new year, 2024. Quick, quick question. So it talks about the uh, emergency management bill lapsing and, and the government potentially reinstating it. Is that, um, is that likely or is that, do you have any indication yet of that or are they going to hold for a while or what's, what's your view there? So the, the chair, the emergency management bill has been reinstated and is with the select committee at the moment. Mm. Uh, I don't have any information about whether we'll move past that as it's currently proposed past that. Uh, but as soon as I do, I'll let the committee know. That looks like it's just proceeding smoothly then. Please, please, Always an interesting time, <laughs> an incoming new government, particularly really new, not the incumbent, um, and a time we need to better understand what the intent is. We've seen some intents through the 100-day plan and all those sorts of signals, and we just acknowledge that there is a uh, procedure process waiting time. Uh, we will work under current uh, rules and processes until furthermore is known when those processes come, maybe. Thank you. Thank you. No other questions around Team Lily. Thank you for coming to join us today. It is always far easier to engage more directly and quickly uh, when you're here in the room. And thank you for your support of the committee. Uh, it's appreciated, <coughs> particularly given that we did experience in 2023, unfortunately, <laughs> some 2023 events. But that you know to be here for us. Thank you. So, do I have a mover actually to receive our um, update from Emma? Thank you, Mayor Denia. Thank you, Mayor Luca. Moved by Mayor Denia, seconded by Mayor Luca. All those in favour, please signal aye. aye. Those against, the item is carried. So, with the agenda of item eight, we have no consideration of further items on the agenda. Oh. Councillor Scott, why? Hey, um, just really a, a process thing. I think I may have moved a resolution about apologies earlier on, and of course I'm an alternate, so I better not. Point of order. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that for you. So, Scott, was at the meeting, I'll we'll change it to Councillor Cameron. Thank you for that. Well done. Councillor Scott, catching that before we finish that off. Yeah, could, otherwise you would have been a gay or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, lots of people on the inside as well. Thank you, Councillor Scott. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been fine. Thank you for your concern and care. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Right. Yeah, and um, just to suggest, I, I didn't think it was earlier when you called for the items, but um, Perhaps for the next year when we meet, if we could get some sort of evaluation on our digital connectivity response, because the district after seeing what happened over on the East Coast, I don't know how far we are down that 
down that pathway, but um, we've probably all got different needs at different places, yeah. That's a good idea. Thank you for that. Could I finish with a bouquet? Please. See bouquets after all the questions. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. So after we had uh, Liz and Joe's uh, tsunami report with their visit to um, Japan, uh, Makatani District Council we had them come in here and present to us, and they felt it was the most valued present, external presentation that we'd had. Um, and subsequent to that, Councillor Puller, who's involved with the Fakatani Rotary Club, um, asked them to come and speak to the Rotary Club. I think that was last week or the week before. Um, and it was uh, really well attended, and the feedback was, out of all the presentations they've had over the last few years, that was the most relevant um, and informative. So, um, in particular, it was after hours. So it was really just to extend that, that thanks and acknowledgement to them. Cheers, through the chair, just following on from from the Mayor is um, Bradley Scott is, is another one that is quite a oh, yes. riveting person to listen to. Um, you don't sleep for a couple of nights afterwards, but um, nonetheless, he, he's very, very informative and, and quite good to come to that sort of speak. <laughs> Grim, Grim Reaper like Grim is Reaper. actually the, the comment that's been put forward. So if we can separate the A8 from the Grim Reaper, we might be able to breathe in between Councillor Campbell. There's nothing further. I'm oh, just wondering if we should have the, the LTP on emergency management. <laughs> no. Okay, all right. <laughs> Thank you, Mia. There's nothing further. I know we've come. We have uh, Councillor Thurston that's running quickly to join us. This is a bit Councillor like the mountain in Muhammad, you know. Yeah. <laughs> we moved the Regional Transport Committee here today yes. because all the mayors were here. So um, that commences at one o'clock with a workshop. And there's an open invitation to everyone, all the politicians, to participate in that. And that's followed by another meeting at three o'clock. But the workshop's going to focus. We're on the home straight with the Regional Land Transport Plan. So, look, in my meetings, as you know, are very inclusive. So everyone gets speaking rights. So any input and collective uh, knowledge and experience will be welcome. So that's in the workshop at one o'clock. And then there's another council meeting of the Regional Transport Committee at three o'clock. And there's two key presentations, one about road policing issues in the Eastern Bay, and another one, as Mayor Denya knows, about some issues around State Highway 2 that will be very interesting. So about two people coming in the public forum. But no, it's just an open invitation, Your Worship, to anyone who's here and not in a hurry to go home to come and join us and give us some of their collective wisdom. So. Thank you, Chair Thurston, Thanks. for the warm Thanks invitation. So Joined up thinking, linking everything together uh, is absolutely a principle and a value that Chair Thurston supports. Uh, also important in terms of regional transport, how our people move around in the way that we live. Very important. Thank you for the warm invitation. Um, if we have nothing further, Director and all day, thank you all for your energetic uh, contribution, uh, for your commitment to look after everyone who calls the Bay of Plenty home. Thank you to our emergency management, Fano, Clinton. As I always say, please keep <clears throat> safe. Uh, thank you, Paul Hunter, with all the love in my heart. I hope not to see you and the team over the, <laughs> over the break. Uh, but should we have to, it's great to put a face to a name so that we can uh, connect very quickly on the relationship and do what we need to do should it be needed. Um, we invite everybody back in the new year. Our next meeting will be held Friday the 5th of April in 2024. So please, over the uh, coming season, spend time with family and friends. They are often forgotten or they have to wait at the end of a very long line in the work that we do. Uh, for our communities, it's both a blessing and a burden. Wish you well. And I'll close our hui with karakia. Kia ino i tātou. Kia tau. Kia tātou katoa. Kia ta whaio tō tātou ariki a ihu kauti me te arohao te atua me te whiwhinga tahitanga ki te wai ra tako. Ake, ake. Our meeting is closed at 11.54am.